Technology at Johns Hopkins University, presenting outcomes of non-primary PCI at hospitals with and without on-site cardiac surgery. The CPORT e-trial, final medical outcomes. Now, unfortunately, Tom has to leave right after uh, his presentation here to go on to another presentation. So in this case, we're going to open up uh, a, a small period of time for questions for Tom on his presentation here. Uh, but after that, all the other presenters will, will have their questions uh, at the end of the session. Tom, would you come on up and tell us what you found? We conducted a um, trial to measure the outcomes of non-primary, that is non-emergency angiogenesis, when that's performed in hospitals with and without on-site cardiac surgery. The motivations for the trial were, um, were several. One of them was that you know, back in, in 1999, year 2000, it was clear that primary angiogenesis, the emergency angiogenesis, safely and effectively in hospitals without on-site cardiac surgery. That and a number of other studies led to the development of standalone primary angiogenesis programs, which we believe reduce mortality, reduce morbidity, improve access and promptness of care for STEMI patients. But they had a very difficult time, these standalone programs, surviving from the human resources and a financial point of view. So one of the major motivations for this project in non-primary angiogenesis is to determine whether or not those same centers could also add to their volume and reduce their financial and human resources burden by performing non-primary PCM. We were also concerned about access issues and concerned about the need for research and information in the area. So that's why we did this. In 60 centers in 10 states, randomized over 18,000 patients to have an who required angioplasty, to have that angioplasty in the hospital with or without onset cardiac surgery. And we measured a number of outcomes, both short-term outcomes, so called safety outcomes, mortality six weeks after the index intervention, uh, and then a longer-term outcome, so called quality outcome, which is a major adverse event composite outcome of death myocardial infarction or the need for target vessel revascularization, second procedure. <coughs> the safety outcome, which we reported in six weeks, was non inferior. So this was a non inferiority trial. We wanted to know whether or not there were any significant differences between the hospital outcome, that these outcomes in hospitals with and without outside cardiac surgery to remain a certain measure of statistical significance. So for mortality, mortality was about 0.9 in both groups at the end of six weeks, and it was not inferior at the hospitals with onsite cardiac, without onsite cardiac surgery. At nine months, we measured the so-called quality endpoint again, death recurrent MI, or MI, and target vessel revascularization, and found that the incidence of that MACE was not inferior at hospitals <coughs> without onsite cardiac surgery. Another thing that we noted that uh, in, in a variety of other analyses was that Target vessel revascularization, the need for a second procedure, was slightly higher, depending on how you did the analysis, somewhere between about 1.1% and 1.7% difference in the need for a second procedure, higher at the hospitals without onsite cardiac surgery. So, our conclusion is that, and we should also say that other adverse events such as bleeding, stroke, um, Renal failure, a need for vascular surgery, uh, were all the same at the hospitals and with and without on site cardiac surgery. So, our conclusion at the end of this is that non primary angioplasty when performed at hospitals without on site cardiac surgery is non inferior in terms of the intention to treat analysis for both safety and quality uh, at hospitals without on site cardiac surgery. So I think Thank you very much, Tom. Please stay up here a little bit. I'm here to open it up for questions. I also appreciate that the media has not had a chance to have the handout of Tom's slides.
And the ACC has them in the back. We'll be giving them to you in the media room uh, for, your, uh, for your perusal. Yeah, if you have questions, please come to the microphone, identify yourself, speak loudly to, in deference to the people who are listening in on, uh, on the telephone or whatever. Uh, it's now officially open for questions for Tom. Hi, Crystal Fenn, Community Agency. Thank you so much for Well, first of all, of course, there are longer term results. And, uh, one of the things we've always been criticized in cardiology about is the short term nature of the outcome that we measure. But I think, just in terms of mortality, longer term outcomes are significant. But in addition to that, this MACE outcome, this composite death, two way of myocardial infarction, target vessel vascularization, is a surrogate for quality. And so, whereas the six weeks, outcomes referred to safety, death, at the end of six weeks. This is more of a quality. There's no further follow-up until the trial is over? Well, there's no trial is over. I'd like to add a little bit to that. Uh, this study was quite important. Uh, when we look at our clinical practice guidelines from ACC and AHA related to elective PCI, up to November this past year, it was considered class three, that is, we should not do elective angioplasty. At the time of the updating of our, reg, uh, of our guidelines, it was moved up to a 2B, which means it seems uh, possibly that this is something that we could do. And that was based on observational studies, uh, one of them from the NCDR. So this study is a true randomized clinical trial showing uh, safety and efficacy important uh, finding for us all. Following up on that, um, will this trial then give, the, uh, give this a, a, another upgrade in the guidelines? And, uh, and then another, I'm sorry, another upgrade? In the, in the guidelines, so uh, from, you just said it 2B, will this now get a higher, uh, a higher level and you think it deserves that? And, and, and what do you think is the likely the clinical impact? Is this really going to uh, change the well, I, I, I can't answer the question without changing the guidelines. Um, but I can say that um, the, the purpose of the study was not to encourage expansion of the of the centers. That was not the purpose of the project. The purpose of the project was to answer the question whether healthcare planners in, in various states can help decide, can, can use this angioplasty without onset cardiac surgery as a tool. Is it an option? And I think what the study says is that yes, this is an option. It doesn't say you ought to go out and do this. You shouldn't go out and expand this willy nilly wherever you have a cardiac problem. That is not the purpose of the project. Hi, Dr. Albert Simon, Pat Rich, Canadian Health. I guess the same issue phrased a slightly different way. Were you really surprised by these findings, given that you sort of raised the bar for the community hospitals that were in the study and they had to reach some certain requirements to be prepared to do this? Were you surprised there was really no difference between the two groups? Well, obviously, if we thought that there were going to be major adverse events or major differences, we would have gone down this road. But I think the, the, the thing that's very important, like you said, and comes out does not come out either in the New England Journal paper or in the presentation that I made is what you're alluding to, which is that these hospitals did not simply <coughs> buy stents and guidewires and start doing the aging testing. That was not the case. They went through a formal development program where a myriad of issues, both logistical, patient care issues, political issues within the institutions, were identified and resolved this even got started. And I think that, so if you're asking me, was I surprised? I was glad that we had set those parameters out in terms of volume, in terms of the competency of the interventions. It also did a very formal development program, which took you know, somewhere between three and six months, depending on the institution to complete. So, you raised an important point. Well, that's 
an interesting question. I, I and this is going to sound like a very sort of insane answer, but I did not have direct control over who did and didn't get into the study. I did have control over once they were in the study, if they didn't, didn't complete all of the development program, or if they started doing angioplasty and the volume spell or weren't adequately taken out of the study. But for the most part, because this study was conducted in states that required a certificate of need to do angioplasty, the sites that were selected had to get a waiver to that certificate of need to be allowed to participate. And so the state, in, in, in that sense, in many of the states, controlled who could and couldn't get into the project. Say, well, then, why don't you write a cookbook and distribute it among the hospitals? And the, and to some extent, the guidelines, the national guidelines that we have, have been very important in that regard. The trouble is that when you get down into reality and find the various, for example, political issues that can importantly, within an institution, which can importantly affect patient care, those are unique, peculiar to each of the institutions. And so those logistical issues and political issues have to be appropriately addressed in those individual institutions. And that makes the development program, although conceptually, you know, there's lots of concepts that we could, we, could, uh, we could teach, it makes it unique to each of those institutions and not a cookbook kind of process. Okay, but building on that comment, I will say that professional societies and society at participants have Angiography and Intervention has published a paper a few years ago looking at how cath labs could meet competency in terms of being able to utilize the strategy of PCI without outside surgery. And just this week, uh, ACC and, and Sky are, uh, are publishing an updated document of competency criteria that they look at how we can ensure uh, cath lab quality, I would refer. Last uh, question, please. Um, Dr. Brindis, or maybe Dr. Stone, is one confident that I think this trial should be applied and if you have any concerns about it, you know, I can visit on it. You know, I really haven't read the full article yet, so um, I think before commenting on that, I you know, would like to do that. And it was interesting to me that there were some differences in the way Andrew was performed in both the sites. And Tom and I were just talking, you know, that, uh, you know, this trial was done and started a significant time ago. And there's been an evolution in the way um, off-site um, hospitals do primary PCI. So I won't make any global conclusions. Okay, thank you, Tom. Next, we're going to have Dr. Brett Stone, who serves as the Director of Cardiovascular Research and Education at Columbia University Medical Center in New York, Presbyterian Hospital. This study is Infuse AMI, a two by two factorial multi center prospective randomized, randomized evaluation of intracoronary abcixumab and aspiration therapy in patients undergoing primary PCI for interior SDMI. Thank you, Ralph. Well, you know, the whole world now has accepted primary angioplasty as the optimal way to infuse patients to say an elevation MI, and we do that as expeditiously as possible. And we've gotten very good at getting the infarct out of the open with risk flow down the epicardial coronary artery. But we're often very frustrated that despite doing that in a timely fashion, we still end up with significant <coughs> large heart attacks, larger than we would like, and many patients develop heart failure, and some patients still die, of course. One of the reasons that large heart attacks may occur after angioplasty is that the lesion that causes an angioplasty is very soft, um, it's friable, and then it has a blood thrombus on it, a blood clot. And when we do angioplasty with balloons and stents, it's probably ubiquitous in that we very commonly or always knock some of that material downstream. We hope that it passes through the distal arterioles and capillary system, but when you've got significant platelet, white blood cell clumping, et cetera, or larger um, uh, thrombotic debris or atheromatous debris, 
being clogged in distal microcirculation cause capillary block, and therefore you don't get effective diffusion and you get a large heart attack. Two ways that people have tried to reduce that distal embolization of atherothrombotic debris are either through um, intracoronary, intracoronary abscissomatic infusion <coughs> into the guide catheter of the coronary artery that's causing the heart attack, or aspirating or extracting the atherothrombotic debris before doing balloon angioplasty or stenting so it wouldn't go downstream. And all the prior studies have been conflicting on whether these two um, modalities actually help. In regards to aspiration, the largest trial of aspiration, which was a single study center in the Netherlands called the TAPAS trial, um, actually did find that it helped. It just modestly improved what we call reperfusion success, but there was a large reduction in mortality. And the reduction in mortality was, I think, larger than what we would expect um, when you put the relationship to reperfusion success. Uh, Multi-center trials have been less positive or negative for aspiration thrombectomy. Given intracoronary abscissomab, there have been a lot of positive small trials, but a very large recently done trial called ADASTEMI, which I've talked about uh, during the question and answer session in the main conference, was negative for clinical outcomes. But in all of those studies, intracoronary abscissomab was given again through the guide catheter. And the problem with doing that is that you want to establish a very high concentration of the drug either at or within the uh, thrombus. And when you give it to an occluded, let's say, left anterior descending coronary artery, the blood, which contains the drug, will always take the path of least resistance, which is the open circumflex artery. So you may not bathe in the thrombus in as high a concentration of six matter as you like. In addition, the catheter may not always even sit well in the coronary artery, and so you have blowback of the drug in the aorta. So we designed a study to try to see if either of both of these modalities would truly reduce heart attack size in patients with myocardial infarction. And we specifically made this a study of large heart attacks, because that's a real clinical need. And we know who these patients are. They're patients who come in with an anterior infarction in the front wall of the heart, with either an occluded proximal or um, mid-left anterior descending artery, who present with absent blood flow or minimal blood flow by the time they get to the cath lab. And these patients will have heart attacks of 20, 30% or more of the left ventricle, and they end up often with heart failure. But they also have to come in early if we're going to be able to do anything about it. Once you spend about four or six hours with uh, um, chest pain symptoms, for most patients, the window to reduce the size of the infarct has been closed before you got a transdural infarct. So we randomized 452 patients with large anterior myocardial infarctions presenting within about three and a half or four hours of their symptoms with inclusion of the proximal and mid-left anterior descending artery to basically one of two different treatments. First, aspiration versus no aspiration. And the aspiration device we used was the exact same one in the TAPAS trial that showed the significant benefits. The second arm was intracoronary abscissomab versus no um, abscissomab, but we used a different type of device than had been used before in all the other studies. To overcome those limitations I've talked about, we use a device called the Clearway RX catheter, which is like a weeping balloon. So the drug comes in the balloon, weeps out, and you put the balloon right at the site of the blockage in the blockage itself. So it really, all the abscissomab gets to the site of the infarct lesion and the thrombus. Um, so this was a two by two randomization, um, basically aspiration, no aspiration, each with and without abscissomab. <coughs> and the primary endpoint of this study that we powered the study for was infarct size measured by cardiac MRI, probably the best way, the most accurate way to look at an acute infarct. And we importantly pre-specified 30 days. Many early studies do two to four days, and the infarcts are much, much larger at two to four days. But that's because you're not really measuring all infarction. You're measuring infarct plus edema or water in the myocardium. That makes it very much easier to power a study. You can do this kind of a study in 100 patients or 120 patients. But if you want to see what the real size of the heart attack is, you have to let that be resolved. And most of it, not all, but most of it is resolved by 30 days. And that's a good time before the patients start having other events which then may uh, confound your interpretation. So this was a multi-center, multinational um, study in 37 sites in six different countries. We screened over 3,600 patients with ST segment elevation MI to 
fine for 452, so it's 7.2%, and that's because we only wanted those patients in whom we could really show a reduction in infarct signs. We got the patients we needed, we did the randomization as expected, the investigators were very good at carrying out the uh, protocol procedures. And what we found was the intracorneal of Sixamab reduced infarct size in 30 days. And these were all patients, by the way, undergoing primary angioplasty with bivalve rooting. And that's important because that keeps bleeding rates very low. And we didn't use a 12 hour infusion of Sixamab in anyone. It was just a bolus intracorneal of Sixamab through the clear way RX catheter, or no, there was no bolus in Sixamab. So there was a reduction in infarct size in 30 days. Um, there was no significant reduction. We were a little bit surprised to see in either ST segment resolution or myocardial blush, which are markers of immediate re myocardial reperfusion, but infarct size is considered the strongest prognostic indicator of future survival. And there have been many studies now strongly linking CMRI and infarct size to survival. The study was empowered for clinical events though. Regarding the second arm of aspiration, we did not see a reduction in infarct size with aspiration. The infarct sizes were almost identical, um, and neither was there an improvement in myocardial reperfusion success or any clinical endpoints as well. So our main conclusions of this study is that the um, intracoronary bolus of six and a half given through the clearway RX catheter does decrease infarct size, although it was a modest reduction. We had kind of pre-specified that a 6% reduction of the total left ventricular in, uh, mass, reducing that amount of infarct size would be kind of clinically relevant. We got half of that, basically, with the uh, um, infusion catheter and the Um uh, So I think that it doesn't, it's not, this is not a definitive study. We now need a larger outcomes trial to see if that amount of infarct size reduction, perhaps even in a slightly broader patient population, can be safely applied effectively gets translated into improved clinical outcomes. Regarding aspiration, it's hard for me to understand um, how aspiration can work as a routine therapy if it doesn't reduce infarct size. And even in the TAPAS trial, when they looked at biomarkers, an area on the curve, they saw no reduction in infarct size. Uh, so it makes us wonder if that was a real finding or not, or it's a chance finding. So there are two very large outcomes trials ongoing in aspiration called the total and taste trials in Canada and Sweden. And I think the final word on aspiration will be spoken for those two trials. Uh, but again, uh, it's hard to imagine how it can be positive if it doesn't reduce any other signs. Uh, thank you, Greg. And we'll hold these questions uh, to all the presenters have uh, gone forward. Our next presenter is going to be Dr. Yo Su Kim. He's the director of the Cardiac Catheterization Coronary Intervention at Seoul National University Hospital in the Republic of Korea. He's going to be presenting uh, his comments related to the randomized comparison of adding solastazole versus doubling the dose of clopidogrel after receiving PCI, for cutaneous coronary intervention. This is the host sure randomized Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the first one that PCI is very special here because there is a very high risk of thrombosis. So we need a more stronger antibiotic regimen for this specific first month of PCI. There are two options that are feasible for in many countries in the world. The first option is double dose clopidogrel, drug and DDA. DDAT. And the evidence for DDAT was observed in obtained in previous clinical trial, and it's one trial, the current trial is a seven trial, where they confirmed the superiority of one week duration of DDAT over conventional dose of DDT. Uh, so uh, <coughs> now in Western countries, uh, in specific high-risk patients such as ACS patients with PCI, DDAT for one week may be a choice of treatment. But in you know, Eastern countries, uh, we don't use uh, DDAT because TAT, triple antibiotic therapy, in other words, addition of slow on the top of conventional dose of drug therapy is uh, widely used. So 
in our Eastern region, we usually use the triple and the third instead of B, 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 for high risk patients. But uh, there is no uh, uh, trial to compare head to head between T18 versus B, B, B. So in our poster show ICT, we try to compare T18 versus DB18 in all chronic design patients. For this uh, purpose, uh, we uh, ignored about 3,755 patients from 40 centers in Korea. This is the biggest group of primary in South Korea. And uh, we uh, analyzed one month clinical net outcomes. The primary endpoint was composite of product death, infarction, stent thrombosis, stroke, and plato major pain, which was 1.4% in BB18 at one month versus 1.2% in K18. So the non inferiority was met in this primary We also analyzed the each component of um, the positive, such as product death, uh, infarction, stent thrombosis, stroke, or pedigree. There is no significant difference of the instance of each component between two different terms. We also performed the top protocol analysis that uh, those patients need uh, um, EAT for one month or EDAT for one month. Uh, included uh, cohort in this public analysis was over 1,700 patients in TAT group, uh, over 1,600 patients in BBAT group. The final point was 1.6% in BBAT group versus 1.2% in TAT group. So non inferior was also observed in public analysis. <coughs> But uh, the only thing that uh, shows a statistical significance between two different uh, aspect therapy was spontaneous infarction after discharge, which occurred in no patients among more than 1,700 patients treated with TAD, but observed in five patients among over 1,600 patients treated with TAD, which was statistical significance. So in conclusion, uh, uh, we need a more potent antibiotic therapy than conventional uh, dose of drug therapy for a specific duration of uh, <coughs> high risk of thrombosis after a PCI. We suggest the first one that PCI is, uh, uh, has a high enough risk uh, to be uh, managed more aggressively than the Conventional dose of DAT. So we suggest uh, there are two kinds of more potent uh, such as DAT and TAT. In our results, both treatment shows a compound. In other words, TAT was not inferior to DAT. But uh, another, another type of message in our study is such kind of both uh, more stronger and the regimen for this kind of brief period, just four weeks, it was safe. That to reduce uh, event rate variable, variable value. So, such a kind of more potent regression for a brief period can be applied to uh, more widely in your practice to improve different outcomes that the DSM Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Our last presenter is Dr. Fabio Bawanga. He's the director of the Research Institute 84 at the Cardiac Hospital of Sao Paulo. He's going to be presenting the Bridge Study, the Brazilian Intervention to Increase Evidence Usage in the Acute Coronary Syndrome Study. So, let me do it. Uh, as you know, nowadays, cardiovascular disease, especially ACS, represents the leading cause of death globally. The problem is that 80% of the burden associated with such diseases happen now in low and middle income countries. 
as is the case of Brazil. Brazil is an upper middle income country if you check the current World Bank classification. So it's really going through, in the last years, your epidemiological translation. That explains a lot, transition, sorry, and that explains a lot of that. In terms of ACS, we have several studies, several trials. Every year, I'm sure you come here to see good drugs, good advice, and a lot of new trials. We have very good guidelines. The problem is physicians don't apply these guidelines in practice. There are important gaps between what the guidelines recommend and what is done in practice, <coughs> regardless how easy it is. Even for a simple intervention as aspirin, it's not 100%. <coughs> So that's a real problem. And changing behavior, it's very difficult. So uh, this is a problem in Brazil, too. We have a national registry of MI, and we saw a lot of gaps, very similar to seeing several other countries. And quality improvement science requires that you do a, some specific types of studies using specific types of intervention. The best type of study in theory to test the quality improvement intervention is a cluster randomized trial in which you randomize a cluster, for example, to be a hospital. And then you randomize a cluster to receive an intervention versus control because if you randomize at a patient level, contamination will be very high. I cannot test a quality of intervention and ask the physician to use the tools in one patient and don't use them in another patient. That's impossible. So you really need a cluster randomized trial. Few cluster randomized trials were conducted. ACS, and none, uh, as far as we know, in uh, middle-income countries. So we designed that, we approach it, our Ministry of Health. Brazil is, as you know, is in a very interesting economic moment. The economy is really growing and really stable. So nowadays our authorities are hearing us and are funding uh, research. So they funded this trial, and we uh, invited the largest public hospitals in it's for general hospitals, from capitals, from all states, so major urban areas. Brazil has a 200 million population, and about 70 percent, the health is free for all. So 70 percent of the Brazilian population uses the public system. So that's where the majority of ACS patients will run. So we invite such hospitals. We were able, according to our sample size calculation, to include 34, 34 largest public hospitals in the country, and we randomized them to receive a multifaceted quality improvement intervention or routine practice, whatever they are already doing in real life. So what was this multifaceted quality improvement intervention? As I mentioned, uh, implementation science, the design is important, there's a trial, and we also know from experiences and trials in other areas that usually the active interventions which are the ones who really work. So this include, for example, any sort of reminders, printed or electronic, uh, case management, someone really looking that the procedures are being done. The, the best analogy I would do with health would be an airline. Uh, as you know, every time you get in a plane, someone will read some, but uh, there's a case management. You, you know, the crew will check if everyone is with her fastener seat belts, Six in the upper you actually check. So that's what a nurse did here. Uh, so th these are active interventions, so case management reminders. And we also have passive interventions, like, for example, educational materials, which are useful if not used it alone. So in this case, we designed some sort of reminders, case management, case management, sorry, and educational materials. So what were the reminders? Reminders were we wanted to very quickly identify a patient with ACS that arrived at the ER. As I'm, I'm sure is a problem in several other countries and in some places in the US, overcrowded. In Brazil, it's a real problem. So prioritizing the right patient, quickly identifying them is very important. So we use a simple label, as you saw in the presentation, with chest pain to be based on the evaluation form. So this patient is prioritized. As soon as, as soon as this patient is referred for the attending physician, we gave the physician a simple checklist with a summary of all major guidelines in accordance with guidelines from ACC, and Brazilian Society of Cardiology guidelines, which are pretty much the same. 
So we, we wanted people to fill this checklist and make sure they follow all guidelines. Besides that, we train it a case manager, which is a nurse, one or two from each side, so they would be able to make sure that all procedures are being done, and most importantly, that liaison with physicians, etc., and follow the patient throughout hospitalization. As was very well pointed out by the panel in the session, probably, probably a, a really believe that a case manager here was the most important part of our intervention. And also we send, you know, to all physicians and distribute the educational materials, pocket guidelines, posters, etc. So it's, in theory, a simple intervention. As I mentioned, it's never simple to design such interventions for changing behavior, but compared to, like, very, it's, it, it does not require, I mean, simple because it does not require very expensive or, or technology. And we want it to be simple to make it applicable to, to, to various scenarios. So, and, and we compare sites, 17 sites received the quality improvement intervention. Once again, 70 site, 17 sites uh, received the, uh, the work in the control group. And we measured adherence to all recommended evidence-based therapies, all therapies recommended by guidelines during the first 24 hours. And during the whole hospitalization, and also we measure uh, not only for the, an outcome defined by the bridging science trial, but also using an outcome validated by, by a very large registry here in the US, the Crusade Registry. And we found an 80, between an 80 and 19% increase in the uptake of evidence based therapies in clusters randomized to, to the quality improvement intervention. It must be acknowledged that clusters were similar one year before. We measured the same clusters. They were absolutely similar, about only half of the patient, less than half of the patient actually uh, received all the recommended therapies. And I would, I would expect a similar scenario in several other countries. Uh, so we also measured clinical events. Uh, as I pointed out in my presentation, uh, we found the, the point estimates of the effects were all in the right direction, except for bleeding that we saw in trend, no significant trend there increase bleeding. Which is expected because we recommended more antithrombotic therapy. Absolutely expected. Uh, but the study was not designed, it was not large enough in terms of the number of events, the number of clusters, to assess the effects of this intervention in clinical events. So that, that will be a second step. Okay? So we really uh, consider the Bridge ACS trial as a first step. That's good enough. Well, thank you. Thank you very much to all our presenters. I also want to announce that we actually have Pat O'Gara, our ACC 12 uh, co-chair, and, and maybe Doug Weaver will be stopping by later as we answer some of the questions, and we're particularly lucky to have some of our discussants, uh, Dr. Oldman, Dr. Daniels, and Dr. Montalesco, who also uh, would be available for uh, questions from the press. At this time, I'd like to, uh, oh, I have one other announcement. Uh, I know that a lot of you have been interested in uh, look, asking about uh, uh, Vice President Cheney's uh, transplant, and we have uh, Dr. Uh, Mary Marine Walsh, who will be also available after this news conference at 11 a.m. She's actually the Medical Director of Heart Failure and Cardiac Transplant uh, Service at the St. Vincent Heart Center in Indiana, playing a substantial role for here at the ACC as Chair of our Patient Center talk to her afterwards. So, uh, please identify yourself and speak clearly in the microphone. Hi, I have a question for Dr. Stone. This is Bruce Jansen from Cardiology. Uh, actually, a couple of quick questions. What do you make of this finding? We have the best outcomes of our dual intervention arms. I think it's interesting, but it's, as you say, it is a post hoc finding. Each individual group is only about 100 patients. Um, so, I, I still think there is some role for aspiration in patients with large thrombus. Uh, you know, they clearly do not communicate the results on the only diet. But uh, for the most part, the aspiration arm by itself was so negative, and there was absolutely no interaction between the two that uh, I would go for the primary endpoint of the trial and I would go apply this to patients. And uh, is there a large outcome from the trial? Uh, there's not currently one here. Got these results in a short time. 
Mitchell's a living cardiology <coughs> director. Um, it seems like one difference between the two regimens you tested is the one that uses celastazole has a, uh, on taking the celastazole as a BID regimen and the clopidogrel is once a day. Does that difference, do you think, have any, uh, would lead to any difference in compliance when used in routine practice? Also uh, uh, associated with poor compliance. But actually, uh, the compliance of TAT is uh, poorer than prognosed TAT. But uh, actual discontinuation rate of TAT is about uh, five to seven percent when we continue TAT for six months. So, this kind of discontinuation uh, rate is uh, dropped when we shorten the duration of TAT just one month down to 2.5%. So actually, there are some side effects of TAT in, in the patient's side, but the benefit of TAT is uh, remarkable, not only in the vision, but also uh, vision of late by both. Uh, some people say it's a, it's a some of the protective effect or the modifying effect. So uh, it's, it's such kind of severe condition that we supposed to have We encourage the patient to take Based on uh, the results of this trial, have you, has it led you to do any change in um, the regimen that you're using in your own practice? I'm sorry? Have you adopted either of these regimens into your own practice? Yes, yeah, so in Korea and Japan, most, most physicians are focused on the uh, anti-histology effect of psilocybin. So uh, they usually prescribe TAT for six months. Not only to inhibit play, but also to inhibit mental control. But uh, from the results of post CT, we are going to suggest shorter duration of TAT to avoid such kind of side effect of living risk, minor living risk, that is more common when they continue this medication for six months. Nowadays, uh, the stent is very efficacious. So, the restenosis issue is not uh, addictive anymore. So we are proposing a short-term duration TAT to target uh, a plate in a specific duration of uh, high-risk period of the And, and uh, Dr. Bridges, um, more generally, do you see that uh, there's a need for more potent anti-plate treatment following PCI in U.S. practice? And do you think these results in any way speak to the need for using a more potent regimen? Well, the answer, of course, is we don't have uh, the, the, study, the study here, which is a very important study, doesn't talk about some of our newer agents that are now available, prosequil and Pentagor. I don't know, Greg, do you want to make a comment on that? Well, yeah, I think we, we have you know, very large evidence-based medicine um, clinical trials that have been done for both of those agents, and I think they have become the standard of care in patients who are not an excessive risk for bleeding. Um, you know, it's just striking in, in hopes to share how low the event rates are. As you mentioned, in the Asian population, um, you know, whether it's genetic differences, uh, diet, whatever, the event rates are extremely low. Um, here, they're three or four times higher, and I, and I think the ischemic events can be powerfully prevented by both Prasquil and Tanker. In terms of safety issue, we, uh, think that TAT is uh, looks like uh, more safe, safer than DAT with your agent. Of course, it is impossible to compare head to head between different studies, but uh, there's some digit. Uh, uh, TB major bleeding instance, non carriage related, uh, TB major bleeding instance at one month was 1% in the type study. But in our study, TAT, the plate uh, major bleeding instance is about 0.5% in TB analysis. So there is some difference in vision. So I think uh, that is a very interesting future topic to compare the safety and efficacy between two 
hospital agent versus EAT with your agent, such as Prosperity. And the issue of adherence, the issue of cost effectiveness all come into play as we try to make these important decisions. Next question, please. Justine Cadet, the Green Basket Dr. Strong, speaking of cost effectiveness, what would be the cost considerations with either of these rear plus, rear plus NGO and um, NGO plus aspiration hospitals? You know, I don't, I don't know the average selling prices of, of any of these right now, so I can't really tell you. I think you could probably call the companies. Um, to the extent that we can prevent clinical complications, then I'm sure they will be cost effective. <coughs> But uh, you know, I mean, they're each. You know, the catheters are probably several hundred dollars, and the drug plus the catheter is probably over a thousand dollars. But I can't give you the exact. And are, are you looking into doing any kind of cost-effectiveness study going forward? No, not from this study. I mean, this was a, again a mechanistic study to see if we could reduce infarct size. I would think that if a large outcomes trial does get done, then that should certainly include a cost-effectiveness. Thank you. I just wanted to congratulate Greg on obviously. <coughs> Used appropriately to say we need an outcome trial to really understand this, but the design of the trial was, I thought, very unique in that it really was uh, focusing on the patients that we worry about the most, the high-risk patients, the big anteriors, the ones that are presenting early, the ones that interventional cardiologists are particularly concerned about and trying to figure out how we can de decrease infarct size. And I think the strategy and focusing at this particular group is going to, uh, I think, hold good value. Uh, your comment related to cost effectiveness, you could imagine that utilizing this technique at lower, lower risk infarcts, less myocardia may not hold true. And so focusing on this particular group may hold huge value in, in understanding your particular concern in that area. Next question. Uh, this question is for Dr. Stone as well, um, Michael Reardon of our uh, In terms of, is there any sense of how free aspirations from that community is performed in clinical practice in the States. And secondly, my question is about the six MMR. I think you touched on it a little bit in terms of the clinical translation of such a modest change in infarct. Is there any way to put that into sort of translate that into what this would look like down the road, six months, a year, anything like that? Right. So um, you know, again, the, the amount of infarct size reduction was about half of what, going into the study, we considered you know, clinically relevant. As you can see, there were small trends for a little bit uh, of improvement in ejection fraction, which wasn't significant. I mean, if you studied 10,000 patients, you know, and you had exactly these results, there probably would be a clinical benefit, but it would be modest. Um, but then, you know, again, the safety outcomes in a large outcomes trial, you know, with the bleeding offset some of that, there probably would be some increased bleeding with a bolus only of 6 MF that may overcome the benefits we saw on horizons for preventing bleeding and thrombocytopenia. So I think we do need the outcomes trial to, to really find out. Um, this might be reasonable now in certain selected patients that are at low risk for bleeding, et cetera, or particularly large, um, you know, inclusions of their proximal ID and present really early. Regarding the frequency of aspiration use, I can tell you it varies markedly. It's more common in Europe than in the United States. I know some people, operators, that will never do an acute infarct angioplasty without aspirating first, and others will almost never do. And I think uh, Dr. Brennan, Brennan's NCDR published a couple of years ago in the United States a uh, um, article or a poster, as it was, that showed that the rates of aspiration were surprisingly low in the United States. So maybe you can comment on the updated experience. I don't have the recent data, but I suspect as you do that there has been an increase. Any other questions for the press? I'd like to ask Dr. Berlinger a question. You know, I want to congratulate your uh, translation of evidence-based medicine into Brazil, and uh, you talked about your strategies, and you mentioned both here and, and also in the main tent about the, uh, the really the big impact was really the case manager, which is, you know, cost money. So I was wondering, and you uh, were, you talked about Brazil being an upper level middle country. I think many people from the United States are gonna see you take, come right up to us very quickly. I'm very impressed with Brazil. So what is the penetration, for example, of electronic health records? And how are electronic health records with uh, 
ordering uh, with uh, decision support tools built in, particularly, for example, the rural hospitals, where we can extend this all over and how that would influence uh, change in behavior and practice. Thanks very much for, for the question. Uh, yes, I mean, in, in Brazil, several hospitals now are starting using, not in Europe, but in the hospital electronic medical records. The, the problem is we don't have so far a unified system, which is which would be perfect, but I mean, that is costly, that is complex to design. So what you're seeing is several hospitals using different systems. But I'm sure that uh, translating what we did with print reminders, et cetera, to decision support systems, probably the effects will be higher of, of the tools and more comparable to just the, the, the action of the case manager. So in this trial, we were not able, because of so many different systems, to develop a unique solution. Uh, but I'm sure that using a, an electronic decision support system would lead to even better you know, application of the Good luck with that, too. We're having a real challenges here in the US. Any other questions from the audience? Do we have anybody on the phone? No? So uh, I, I want to thank you, everyone, for being here. Again, I want to let you know we have our discussants here, Pat O'Gara, Doug Weaver, and of course, our...